Welcome. My name is Kate Laseco, and I am the Assistant Director for Peer Engagement and the Student Experience. We are so glad you could be here with us for our conversation tonight with Dr. David Langer. As we begin our program, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the Firekeepers of the Haudenosaunee, the Indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. For tonight's event, we will host a live Q&A session with questions from the viewers towards the end of the programming. Please submit your questions via the Q&A module at any point. We will address as many questions as time allows. Additionally, please note that this program is available to view with closed captioning. Moderating tonight's event, I would like to introduce our very own Dr. Sandra Hewitt, Beverly Peterson Professor of Neuroscience, Executive Director of Neuroscience Studies and Director of Neuroscience Graduate Concentration Biology. Dr. Hewitt holds the inaugural Bishop Professorship in the Department of Biology at Syracuse University. She studies the molecular and biochemical processes that occur in the brain after injury. She is particularly interested in the function and dysfunction of astrocytes, star-shaped cells that provide physical and nutritional support for neurons. In addition to receiving numerous awards, Dr. Hewitt's research program is recognized at both the national and international levels, and her work has been continually supported from extramural sources since 1997. Accompanying Dr. Hewitt tonight, we are happy to have Catherine Valerian. Kat is a senior in the neuroscience program and is minoring in psychology within arts and sciences, within the College of Arts and Sciences. Kat will be participating in the National Honor Society for Neuroscience at Syracuse University this year, also known as NeuroSci. She comes to Syracuse from the greater Philadelphia area, and she will be asking Dr. Langer questions on behalf of the Syracuse University student body. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hewitt and Kat. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Dr. Langer, for spending the evening with I thought I was unmuted. Am I now? There's always going to be. You are. Um, yeah. I'm good? You're good. Okay, here he is. Here's Dr. Langer. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. David Langer. He is the chair of neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital and vice president of neurosurgery for Northwell Health's Western Region. Uh, in addition, he's a professor of neurosurgery and radiology at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra. He is a nationally and internationally recognized cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, which simply means he specializes in the treatment of disorders of blood vessels, such as aneurysms and other malformations that occur in the brain. At Northwell Health, he has established the Moya Moya Center, and this is dedicated to the diagnosis, treatment, and support of patients and their families with this rare progressive and potentially devastating cerebrovascular disorder. Dr. Langer is also one of the few cerebral bypass surgeons in this country. And so if that weren't enough, Dr. Langer is also an inventor. He developed a smartphone app called Playback Health. Find it online. This app allows clinical providers to curate their patients' medical information and to create personalized multimedia presentations to explain the medical information, to share it with their patients, and then they can share it with their families in order to better explain that information and enhance the patient experience. His commitment to innovation extends to the operating room, as you can imagine, and to the classroom. So he spent time in Japan helping to develop this three-dimensional exoscope device, which I believe he actually uh, shows us in his Lenox Hill uh, neurosur neurosurgical procedures, um, which he named the future of operative neurosurgery. Uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic we find ourselves in, he spearheaded an internship program called Brain Turns, offering free virtual education to high school, college, and medical students. And adapting to this new way of teaching, Dr. Langer and his team has been able to affect over 15,000 students so they can participate in physicians' uh, shadowing experiences that are virtual, including webinars, seminars, and operating room viewing of neurosurgical procedures. So I alluded to this, you might recognize Dr. Langer from the popular Netflix series, Lennox Hill, launched back in June. Uh, he is, this series provides an honest and empathetic look into Dr. Langer's role as a neurosurgeon in New York City. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And others might know him as a proud, he put it on, Syracuse University dad. So his son is a, currently a senior and in the Bandier program within our SI Newhouse School of Communication. So pl please join me virtually in welcoming Dr. David Langer. Thank you so much for coming.
Thanks for having me. All right. So I get to initiate the discussions and um, I do have some burning scientific as being I'm a scientist questions that I and other members of the audience had put. But I do know that before I get to that, uh, a lot of the questions when I was looking through some of the registrants sent questions before and some of our neuroscience students did, and they really wanted to understand what motivated you to become a physician in general and also this crazy cerebrovascular neurosurgeon <laughs> that you decided to become. So I thought maybe you could take a little bit of time to explain how you got to where you are or what your mindset was when you did that. Well, first of all, I wanna thank you, Sandra, for taking the time and for, I'm unfortunately I don't operate at astrocytes, but I know what they are. Uh, and uh, that's number one. Number two, I wanna thank uh, Kate, the team for putting this together. This is really an honor and a privilege to be here. I wanna thank my son for, uh, uh, going to Syracuse. Uh, he's done a great job there and um, I'm very proud of him. So that being said, this is a great opportunity for me to meet the Syracuse community and as a parent there, uh, thank the school in, in a way that that's uh, I think unique and certainly the Netflix show has given me an opportunity to, to uh, experiment with a new voice that I, you know, I had but it wasn't really didn't find an outlet for. So that being said, I mean, to talk about why I become a physician, I mean, these are easy questions. Um, you know, but I'm a third generation physician. Uh, my dad and my grandfather were both doctors. My grandfather graduated from St. Louis University um, Medical School in the 1920s. Uh, my dad uh, went to Harvard Medical School and graduated in 1964. I was, a, uh, he, I was born in 1963. Um, those days people had kids a little earlier. So as, as, as long as I remember, I was surrounded by my kind of male role models were physicians and it, you know, other pictures of me as a little boy with a stethoscope in my ears. I, uh, and I never thought about doing anything else. You know, at, at, at points in my life, I um, reflected on that and wondered what life would have been had I not been a doctor. Uh, but I think I just, my mindset and my kind of personality lend themselves well to being a physician. I probably could have been something else, but I don't know what that would have been, but I'm very, happy that I chose this profession. It's the greatest profession in the world, I think. Um, as far as the decision to become a nurse, it's a little bit more complicated. You know, the easier decision to go to medical school, the hard decision for medical school, you can do anything. You can go into public health, you can go work for a drug company or engineering, you can work for a, uh, a device company. And then the subspecialty you take is really the difference between a family practice doctor and like a heart surgeon or the, the polar opposites of time and effort and training. Um, I, I clearly was emulating my father. I wanted to be a cardiologist. I remember uh, in, in college, I thought about being a neurosurgeon. One of my camp uh, counselors said I was crazy. He was a plastic surgeon. Said, you got to be crazy. All your patients are die or they're infirm. And he was, you know, back then that was kind of right. Neurosurgery changed a lot during my uh, last, last 22 years since I finished my training. But I, I uh, had, was pretty much, my heart was set on a cardiology because my dad did. And I love cardi. I still love cardiology. Um, he had a stroke in between. I took a year off during college and medical school, went to England for a year and I came back and he had a stroke when I was home and it definitely impacted me in, in some ways becoming a vascular neurosurgeon was my, you know, in a, in a kind of psychological profile way was my attempt to cure my father, I think. And, um, you know, I, it, it was a, it was a sequential thing. I didn't like internal medicine. I didn't want to be an internal medicine doctor. I couldn't imagine not going to the OR. I thought about being a heart surgeon. And then I kind of loved neuroanatomy and I watched the neurosurgery residents do cool stuff. And that's how I ended up being a neurosurgeon. It was never like a long burning, a lot of guys, that's what they want to do since they were in embryos. But now I kind of decided later on and I, I think it's a great field. And so it's just a wonderful thing to do with your life. So that's a great point. And I want our students to know that because they say that to me too. Like, did you always know you want to be a neuroscientist? I'm like, no. <laughs> and so I think it's, it's interesting that we can say that you can uh, know in general what you want to do. I did want to be a scientist and then find your path and your passion when you're going through it. So that's great. Um, I know since one of these is it's a Netflix COVID, it's our COVID-19. So, you know, I have to throw you a COVID-19 question, right? So we're in a pandemic. Eight or something. The debates are going to be about COVID, <laughs> the economy. 
<laughs> oh, we could have all those. But, uh, you know, I, I think what's interesting is, you know, initially during the COVID crisis and, it, you know, it shows in, in Lenox Hill, obviously on the news, everything that we saw about New York City was about the, the viral pneumonia, right, and people being on ventilators. But now we know, and you know better, and this is what I want to ask you about, is that, you know, about a third of the patients actually experience neurological symptoms, right? So changes in their mental status, uh, some, you know, talking about brain fog sort of reminds me of like chemo brain, um, but also stroke, like you, you were saying. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about what you think is happening there and whether you've had any experience treating these patients, um, you've seen them or... Yeah, we, we uh, kind of in early March, we're going to shut off neurosurgery, all went home. And there was a concern that the numbers would overwhelm our ability to take care of the patients and we would run out of intensivists. So I got my guys together. We decided to go back and COVID. We actually worked in the ICUs. They didn't see much of it because they had to keep the cameras out of the, out of the hospital. So I, you know, we had so many patients and I'm pretty well trained to take care of ICU patients. I just didn't know anything about COVID or pulmonary disease. I, back in medical school, maybe, but, you know, we learned pretty quickly. I mean, all 12 ICU patients in the ICU were to more COVID. So you saw every aspect of disease. And we saw neurological manifestations. The, the, the reason why COVID basically, there's really kind of two phases. There's the original viral pneumonia, which is really the easiest part to understand. That's just a pneumonitis. It's a non-infectious, it's a non-bacterial pneumonia, which is really an inflammation of the lung. But what kills people is not the original infection, it's the immunological reaction. And the reason why there's a variety of, of outcomes is that um, people's immunological systems are all very, very variable. They're, they're incoherent. They're, some people have very little reaction where maybe they don't know at all they have it and other people die. So what is that? Well, the death from COVID is really, in general, either a pulmonary failure, respiratory failure, which means you just, you just your lungs fill up with fluid and you just can't ventilate people, can't get oxygen in their blood or get the carbon dioxide out, or it's multi-system organ failure that the this kind of autoimmune reaction that the the immune the immunological system not just attacks COVID the virus but attacks self, so the immune system is sort of out of control, and kind of like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a low level uh, autoimmune reaction. This is a very rapid increase in the, all the, the entire kind of, uh, it's an uncontrollable immune response to the lungs primarily, but then it can affect the kidneys, the liver, um, and the brain. And the brain manifestations, if we think of just well, very often people lose sense of smell, for example, is one of the earliest reactions. That's the olfactory tract, which is the, the virus undoubtedly gets into the nose and travels in the olfactory tract and it's way back and you can it causes some sort of disruption in the sense of smell. More concerning is when the virus gets directly into the brain. We think it actually it gets in through two mechanisms. One is through the olfactory tract directly into the forebrain. And actually the other way is actually through mechanoreceptors and baroreceptors that are essentially nerves in the pulmonary vasculature that ascend up the, the, uh, from the chest into the brain stem. In fact, one of the interesting things was people can have very low oxygen levels. Like where you or I, we wouldn't be able to feel like we would feel short of breath. I mean, oxygen saturation is in the 80s. We normally live in the high 90s and are totally fine. And we think that that's the actual virus affecting the brainstem, that these, this baroreceptor, which is the, med, the, the way the brain senses low oxygen, is actually disrupted by the virus. So it's actually a good thing because people are resting comfortably with a saturation of the, the 80%, which is theoretically dangerous. But it's, it's, these are the two ways that the virus can get directly into the brain and cause a direct encephalitis. That's inflammation of the brain from the viral infection. There's also an encephalopathy, which is a swelling of the brain from this, auto, this immune response to the blood-brain barrier, that the immunological reaction of the vessels around the brain can cause an inflammation, leaky fluid gets in the brain, the brain swells, people get sleepy or become obtunded or un unresponsive. So we would see encephalitis, which causes swelling from direct viral invasion or encephalopathy, which is a swelling of the brain tissue. We also saw, saw inflammatory MS, like MS is really an inflammation of the covering of the, of the neurons. And we would see similar, you know, basically some looks like MS, which is punctate areas of inflammation in the brain. Also frank stroke, that the virus can cause hypercoagulability, meaning the, right. the blood sticks to itself and causes either bleeds in the brain or blockage of vessels. And we can see that. The trouble is we weren't able to image people, that it was happening so fast that we weren't, it was too much exposure to, to move patients out of the ICU 
and get them to a magnet or a CAT scanner was exposing the healthcare worker and the, the magnets and the CAT scanner to unnecessary, really, you know, they need to be decontaminated. So we really poorly didn't really image these people aggressively because there was no, there was no treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we're getting better at identifying the differences now as it's come back at a low level, but undoubtedly this virus is a tricky thing and it's, uh, it's unfortunately very dangerous and hard to manage all these different lines of attack that happen. And so the brain unfortunately is a real target for not just the infection, but for the, in, in the inf inflammation that occurs subsequent to that. So what about these long haulers then? The people who do, you know, obviously they've, they've been out three, four months. They might've had a really tough, I mean, you're able to, are you able to image them or is this going to neurology and people are, you know, finally deciding this is real, you know? Well, I mean, we image them. Um, the, the most concerning people, like I have a, one of my colleagues is a surgeon, he's my age who had a bad COVID infection, who's still not right. He's, he's just feels like he's off. You know, the really highly functioning people you know, they're, they're very aware of what they're missing. Not that if you're low functioning, you're not, but you know, that's, I think the most daunting thing that uh, it's very scary. You know, we, um, I, I can't say I'm really scared of it at this point, I'm over that, but you know, you see people who've been affected, you know, we're imaging them. Um, there are some people that don't have anything on their imaging and still don't feel right. Whether that, that's just a, you know, come under the radar, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a profound disruption in your life and your, and your quality of life. And, uh, I think that uh, these are a little harder to measure, some of these after effects. And we're seeing recovery. You know, we're seeing people recover from renal failure and their pulmonary failure. We see it. Uh, whether they'll be actually back to where they were, uh, I'm sure you're going to take some hit. And the brain, too. I mean, I'm sure if you did neuropsych testing before COVID and after, you'd probably pick up some after effects. But hopefully you can overcome this with uh, just time and good health. Thank you. So one of our students sent a note and wanted to know, and you alluded to this actually, so you said something like 22 years ago, it was true, you know, like treat them and street them, right, is what they said. Um, but he wanted to know uh, what the biggest recent trend or breakthrough you thought in neuroscience, and you can also take this to neurosurgery, in particular, what kinds of techniques or procedures that you think will make the biggest impact in the next five to 10 years? What's amazing about neurosurgery, I mean, they're just neuroscience, like, neuroscience is a big deal. I mean, I mean, neurosurgery is not neuroscience, at least it hasn't been historically. It's, it's, you know, I, I know where not to go. I know, you know, I'm not operating on astrocytes. And I, you know, I think that there's a, a bit of a kind of a, a, a uh, idea about neurosurgery that has this kind of uh, idea of being a neurosurgeon. It's, it's in, in popular literature and the movies, it's kind of a, an idea of being a brain surgeon. Um, and we basically don't bother with the, some of the things that you, for example, pay attention to. You know, we know we're not, we cannot, there's good brain and bad brain. It's, it's pretty binary. And the vessels are totally, I mean, I could be operating blood vessels anywhere, really. It just happens to be in the brain. If I clip an aneurysm or open up a carotid artery, you know, I I'm, just hope you don't have a stroke. You know, what part of the brain that it's, it's obviously I'm being a little bit cavalier about this, but it's, it's, it's something we just can't control. Um, we know where not to go, we know we can't do, but it's not at that molecular level, like a neuroscientist or even a cognitive neuropsychologist or, so, so neuroscience is a very vast field. As far as yep. what's going to impact neurosurgery in the future, that's easy. I think it's because, you know, when I was training, it was a very, it was almost like cardiac surgery, oh, you know, lots of open operations and bleeding and brain swelling, you know, but you have to recognize that when I first started my residency in 1992, MRI was just coming on. And what MRI has done for us, it's not only given us new diagnoses, but it's allowed us to create new techniques and technologies to do things less invasively and give, you know, give us new insight. It's just incredible if you think about it. I mean, it's like Star Trek, we're putting into a giant magnet and getting pictures. I mean, we take it for granted, but it's just phenomenal. And I think if I was, what's, what we're seeing in neurosurgery has become much more finesse, much more, much more kind of intellectual. Um, it's not nearly as like, you know, testosterone laden. We're seeing a lot more women go into neurosurgery and people who are a little bit less aggressive and less kind of like slash and burn. And some of the most interesting technologies are some of the neuro uh, stimulators, some of these, these little stents, there's a stent trode that Elon Musk has talked about that where we pass a little electrode, it's like a 
a metal stent that goes up into the brain blood vessels that's parked there and left there and can maybe treat epilepsy or stimulate the brain to treat all sorts of diseases that we couldn't even have conceived of. And so neurosurgery is accelerating towards the idea we're not really operating on the, going to operate on the brain anymore. Where people will look at us maybe in 100 years and say, can you believe these open people's heads? You know, that was just insane. And that's true. I mean, we, we're trying to do everything we can not to open up your head to do the same thing. And, and neurosurgery also encompasses spine surgery too. Spine's the same way, trying to do things through smaller openings, less invasive technology. And I think the, the future is very bright and it's going to look totally different. My, my you know, Ben was going to be a neurosurgeon. His, his, his neurosurgeon would be very different than mine was. He's going to do something totally different. But my, you know, our children's neurosurgery will be wholly different than our own. And I think it's just a remarkably innovative and exciting field going forward. You're not going to be doing and seeing the beauty of the brain in, in your face as much, which is a little bit disappointing, but you'll undoubtedly have huge impact on people's lives and livelihood and be able to make impacts on people that only we could, we could never have conceived of with much less risk. And I think that's the, uh, the beauty of, of and the evolution of innovation. So do you think that, uh, so in, uh, in Lenox Hill, in your Netflix series, do you think that that's bringing what you do to the general public? Because that's sort of the first time even I was able to see, and I found it fascinating. My husband was like, oh, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to watch that. You know, it's like, oh, you should see the tumor they took out. I mean, I was fascinated, right, by exactly what you said, good, good brain, bad brain. And by the way, those are, you know, astrocyte derived. So, you know, sort of, you sort of working on astrocytes. But um, I'm, so I'm wondering how you feel that sort of what you brought uh, to the stocky series, like how did you come to that and think that this might be a good thing for either neurosurgery and or Lenox Hill particularly? Well, my older daughters, um, my stepdaughters, one of them went to Syracuse as well. And I watched them grow up uh, in the social media age, um, YouTubers, and, and obviously I love music, rock stars, um, athletes. And I, I, you know, when I was, when I was in college, um, there was no internet. Uh, there was no, we loved rock music, but it was different. And I think um, I saw the influences that our children had and, and what they, they aspire to be and, and who they looked up to. And um, over time, I was, it was not frustrating. It was just, you know, we started to see you want people, not that everybody should be a neurosurgeon, but we want young, bright people who are ambitious and hardworking, who have grit and who have ethic and who have, who have ambition to consider doing good things for humanity. Good thing. And that doesn't mean you, there's nothing wrong with going and being innovative or being an entrepreneur, going to Wall Street, going to law school, being a, a, a YouTuber. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's, that's whatever suit floats your boat. However, I remember thinking, you know, athletes have this unique ability to be on, be on TV and when you see how we're doing them doing amazing things, we were doing a disservice uh, as physicians, not letting people in. You know, there are many reasons for that. One is that in general, the people who do let them in are promoting themselves. They're, you know, want to show some crazy case that they only they can do because they want to get more cases or the hospital has the, the control and wants to show off something. That's the nature of media. And I, I think, you know, at, at Bandier, or for that matter, Newhouse, you know, we know this, the, what the, the value of media, what we use media for. And I began to recognize that, that um, this was a problem, that we weren't seeing the same types of people go to medical school. That was before Netflix happened. Netflix was a totally random event in my life. I mean, it was, it was total luck that these two people found me and asked me to do this. Um, but I thought of it as an opportunity to let people in and, uh, should not to be not to fake it or not to just be myself and because I knew what we were doing was extraordinary and if and if you let people see that it doesn't mean everybody should be a neurosurgeon but you know one out of a thousand people say you know I I, I think I, and I really want to do that in fact that's what happened I mean the the outpouring of letters and emails and what we've seen uh, plus the brain turn program where 16,000 young people signed up for it that's why we did this I mean that was the intent um, obviously COVID also added a whole, we didn't know that at the time. I'm sort of, you know, I told Kate this morning, we had all these things planned, all these like, you know, public events and red carpet things, you know, we would have been on Fallon or shows. Mm -hmm. I'm still kind of glad we didn't do that because I, I, one, I think it would have just taken away from some of the intent 
it wasn't self-promoting as much as promoting the idea of what people can do and value we can do. And especially now in this political time, you know, caring for each other and, 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 and thinking more than just yourself is so critical to the future of our, of our, our well-being. And uh, so being a representative of that and, and being emblematic of doing that is a unique experience and a uh, unique responsibility. And that's why I'm doing this even tonight. I mean, I think that's the, to express my, my gratitude uh, to be able to have that function. And uh, that's basically why we did it in the first place. So I, um, I know I have, well, I have one more question, I guess, and then I would take it over to Kat, but I know that she has tons of questions that the students were just so excited and, and sent in a bunch of questions. Um, I guess I will ask one of them, which is, or two, actually. They asked what was the favorite part of your job. I think you answered it actually, but, but we'll have you do it again. And then what, what's the least favorite part of your job? So those are the two, and, and, and I wouldn't call it a job. They called it a job. I totally get it. It is your passion. It is your career. It is your destiny. And I think that's yeah, quite I, clear. I, really what I would tell the students is you don't want to have a job. Exactly. I'm sure, you, I'm sure it's not, this not is your, my, it's, it's your passion. It is my life. <laughs> not every day is great. I mean, some days, frankly, are horrible. And uh, yeah. you, know, you go through ups and downs, but I, you know, I don't think of it as a job. It's, it's, it's who I am. Right. No, exactly. That's for sure. My, my, so the, the, the worst that's happened to me and the best thing that's happened or what was the favorite? I think the favorite part of my job is mentoring young neurosurgeons and students. Uh, it's, it's great to see young people. I love, you know, going into a case that isn't mine and um, having one of my junior guys get, through, you know, ask me for help and maybe scrubbing in for five minutes and just getting them to a point and then backing out and seeing them be successful. I think that takes time. I mean, there's four stages of learning. There's unconscious incompetence, conscious <laughs> incompetence, unconscious, I mean, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence. And unconscious competence is a, you we all wanna get there. It's athletes, musicians, and, and for that matter, I think surgeons, you get to a point where you just can handle things. You, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think what your hands are doing. And I feel with certain kinds of operations, I'm, I'm there. You know, I can go in and I can see a problem before it happens. I can point, and I, I just love that. I love, you know, not being the center of attention, going in and helping a junior guy get through it. And then you see him grow and, and, and we both develop a relationship based on that and not taking credit for it. I, I just love that part of my job. I think the hardest part is dealing with complications. Uh, Everyone has them. I tend to be uh, empathetic uh, to my patients and put myself in their position. And um, I've had, you know, we all have complications, but sometimes there are extraordinary complications that set you back for months. And I, though those happen very infrequently. And I can point out the ones that have happened perhaps, I think maybe I can think three or four in my career that are, will never, you'll never, never forget them. And it's important as a surgeon, there are some people who are able to, that doesn't penetrate and they just keep going on and do the same thing all over again. I found as I got, I've gotten older, I'm less aggressive, that I'm more afraid in some ways. I'm more, I feel like I'm more skilled and more able to do things I do, but I have more, I have a different kind of fear. Uh, and I'm more aware of, of even, you know, sort of low, high risk, low prop events. I mean, COVID was a high risk, low prop event. We, and that's, that's on a macro level, it's what happened there. So I do think that if you're going to do this, if you're going to take this kind of plunge and do whether it's neurosurgery or any interventional field, you have to be pretty comfortable with failure and be comfortable with the idea that you're going to hurt people and use that as a learning process be honest with yourself and realize that it's going to be very, very painful. And there are going to be some times where you are just going to be affected by that. That's the nature of the business. And um, I think that it's still hurt. It's still very difficult. Uh, and it's only getting more so because you don't expect it of yourself anymore, yet it still happens. And I think that's clearly the hardest part by far. So one of the things that I noticed um, in your show, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's true, is is the empathy that you were saying. But um, so 
So if I can just share a snippet. So I have trained MD, PhD students and every time they leave my lab, I tell them when they become that MD, they need to remember that the person is somebody's mother, father, sister, brother, right? And I noticed that um, is very important to you. You know, this is a person, this is who they are and um, we need to honor that. But how do you, how do you teach that? Because you're right, like what you do, you could easily cut yourself off, like you said, because it's too difficult. So I'm just curious as to how, whether you can tell whether someone feels that way or. I think many, some of my colleagues reached out and said, I can't do that. You know, I saw your show, I could never be that way. You know, and a lot of people do this for different reasons. People do it for power, for, you know, to tell people you're a brain surgeon, to, for money. You know, that's, that's even crazier. But you can be, it's, and a, look, if you go into private practice and it's all about every case equals a dollar, you, you disconnect. I mean, it just, it doesn't matter as much. Like I, our department, I built our department on salary that, because I knew that this conflict between if I'm working every day and a case I do gets me more money, that, that changes indication, it changes the way re, you react to a complication, it changes the way people behave to one another. I mean, schadenfreude and jealousy are the same emotion. So you want partners that celebrate your successes and are, have your back when there's a complication. It's just the opposite of what happens most of the time. Because if somebody else, if somebody else does a case that you want to do because they're making more money than you, you're like, ah, you see, you should have been, I should have been the one to do that. I see this over and over again. So it's, it, and we have a very unique environment in our department because I, I sought that out. I, I, I couldn't stand the other way. But, um, you know, I, what I tell people basically is that you have to know yourself first. You have to know, you know, you, what, you, what you're able to tolerate. I think that there are a lot of surgeons that don't do that at a def either defense mechanism or they just don't have the depth or the desire to have it because they're driven by other things. And I, I think that my father's illness and his, what happened to him over his, the rest of his life, um, had real impact on me. And, and, and to this day, I, I, I incorporate the filter. And I look, I, I, I'm not perfect. There, there are, some of this comes out in a negative way. I get very pissed off when people don't do the right thing. I, I, I don't suffer for fools. And I, 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 get, I, have a lot, I have to control righteous anger is a terrible thing. And the health system is not driven by empathy, trust me. So it's driven by money. And uh, you know, that's incredibly frustrating. Um, but by the same token, I have to, I'm in the system, and so you have to taper some of your yourself in this system to just come home at night and not just you know have five martinis to be able to, to <laughs> get through your day. So, but you have these these things are real, and, and they require a lot of training and a lot of time, and um, it's challenging for sure. Well, we'll definitely have to have you come back and talk to our students about that so they can understand you know the whole full scope of of our healthcare system, right? Yeah. Beyond just trying to help. Our Zoom. Exactly. So I am going to pass this over back to uh, Lindsay and she's, she, uh, and she's going to, uh, unless you want me to do it, Lindsay, we're gonna bring Kat in and I'm gonna come out and let her take over and, and tell you, ask you the important questions that the students are, are burning. They have a burning desire to know. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra, and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, so I firstly would just like to say thank you again, Dr. Langer, for joining us and allowing me to be the voice for the students and represent them. Um, as you can see by the turnout, they have a lot of questions. Um, so I hope to get through as many as possible. Um, my first question is um, about um, the current demographics in neurosurgery. I'd like to say that um, neurosurgery tends to be predominantly uh, male. And I wonder how we might be able to increase um, the representation of women in neurosurgery and uh, what advice you might have for women interested in the field. Well, I must say it's a major goal of mine. I, some people have read, where are all the women in, in Lenox Hill? Well, I've actually recruited two. They're at Staten Island Hospital, one of our satellites. Neurosurgery will become more, it, it, the, the training is becoming much more amenable. The trouble with women are women. I mean, you can't change biology. And historically, because of the way the residents were trained, you couldn't take time off, the call schedule was horrible. 
and it was very male, very testosterone male dominated. Three things have happened. One is with the amount of how much money we're making has gone down. So it's become less attractive to, you know, high income guy people because it, it just, that's just wasn't what it was where you could make, you know, as much money as you could imagine. Two is that the train, residency training is 80 hour work week and you can go home post call and most residency training programs have research year or two that you can build in family planning. And given this by the same token, the, the attendings and the, the culture is, allows women have babies during residency. And it's, it's it, the trouble of residency is you finish medical in your late, early, mid to late 20s, and all of a sudden you're 30 years old and it's your childbearing years. Now you start your seven year residency. And I think waiting to the end of residency, you're 37, 38, 40 years old, is it's, it's hard. And so we, neurosurgery in particular, I think has done a better job of giving women that opportunity. And the last thing is, is that it's, it's become much less aggressive. It's not, not that there aren't aggressive women there, but you have to remember, I mean, if you look at women and men, it's a, it's like a, it's a sine wave of, you know, there's a, a certain element of kind of very, you know, the male personality of aggressive knife wielding, you know, gun toting, but there are women like that. And then there are very empathetic, sensitive uh, men, just like there are sensitive women. But if, the truth is that they, t they overlap a fair amount, but women tend to be more empathetic, more sensitive, uh, less aggressive by definition. And neurosurgery is becoming a less aggressive field, the non-invasive aspect of it, the thinking part. And so some of the real aggressive aspects to it are, are softening. Residency is training, the resi training is changing. And I think more and more women are attracted to the field. Cardiac surgery is not there yet because cardiac surgery still has a very it's a, it's a tough business. It's uh, late at night and very sick patients and big slashing surgeries. Not that women can't do it, but on average, fewer women are attracted to that than men. And that's just the way it is. I think that neurosurgery is an amazing business. And I think I'll do, I, in fact, I encourage women to go into neurosurgery. We had a women in neurosurgery forum a couple of weeks ago that I try to, I, can, I was pushing these two women that I, I recruited and set up and I can't run that. But the truth is that they were disappointed because it was all about you know, the social aspects. I was like, no, have a meeting where just women talk about vascular nursery, tumors, spine. We have those women out there and there are more and more leaders in nursery that are women. And in fact, when I went into nursery, the, the key to finding your subspecialty is you see someone you wanna be like. That's ultimately it. it and, and in general, when there were no women leaders and women mentors and women people look up to are women, other women says, I don't see anybody that's like me in that business. Why would I do that? Well, now there's more and more of them. So when you get in there, say, I want to be just like her. And that's how you get attracted to it. And right now, about 30% of applicants are women. That's extraordinary. I mean, when I was applying, it was about, it was like 5%. So the, it's, and it's a, it's, it's a slope is in the right direction. I don't know if it'll ever be 50-50, but it'll be close. But right now, like almost 55% of, of applicants to medical school are women. So we've seen a massive change in this. And I think it's a great field for, for men and women. We need to attract more women. We need to find more women leaders. We need to, you know, as men, we need to encourage that because it makes us better to have diversity and have different. So I, I think it's undoubtedly a, a great thing to do. And whether men or women or whatever your sexual preference is or your, your, your gender is, you know, I think we need to have, encourage that, you know, throughout our field for sure. Absolutely. I definitely love the points about um, having uh, representative leaders because I do agree that that is the best way to recruit younger people. Um, and so by handing the mic off to um, current active female neurosurgeons, I think that's the first step for everybody. Um, so the next question from the student list is, what is the most interesting neurological phenomenon that you have stumbled across in your career? Huh. I think there's a, it's a tough one. I mean, I think um, when someone has a, a deficit that you can't explain, you see how the brain is just so amazing. Like, you know, I'll, I'll do an operation that went perfectly well and people wake up and they can't speak. And you do a scan, you don't see anything. Or you realize that uh, there's only so much a human being can do or understand. 
and that we are just that we're just God's creatures in some way. We have zero control, and I, I just do. I think that speech uh, in general is is just so incredible. Like you see disruptions in speech. And there was Oliver Sacks, who was a neurologist at, uh, was my dog, sorry. And what, what makes human beings human is the ability to speak. I'm like a dog. And the truth is, is speech is just incredible. Um, Oliver Sacks, who wrote a book called uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, um, seeing those manifestations of aphasia, which are these speech deficits, and seeing them reverse, and from one minute to the next, it's just, uh, you, 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 it's, it's breathtaking. And I think if, if there's one thing that always gets me, who that just, it's, it just brings you down to earth and is humbling, is, is, are those, when you see that in, 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 right in your face and you just have to smile, like it's just, the brain is truly a, a unique, unique, it's, it's a unique organ. Um, unfortunately, as neurosurgeons, we don't think we were just scratching at the surface. We can't control these things and that's that's hopefully the future will be much better at, at, at not only identifying this repairing them that actually uh is one of my favorite books for that reason just the the mysteries that are uh behind all of those specific case studies that he talks about in that book and i go back to it often because i'm so curious about that yeah. um so just the just, next question I just died about a year ago he, he I did wrote, see that. He wrote an incredible op-ed piece, the New York Times, if you get a chance, it's just incredible. He was, in his last week of life, he wrote this. It's worth reading. So. I'll definitely have to take a look at that. Big fan. <laughs> um, the next question kind of takes a different turn. Uh, what has your experience been like combining um, your professional medical experience with television? I mean, I, I basically let them see me who I was. I. Um, made a, a commitment right early on not to, you know, preen or create, you know, not just, just, it was like, it wasn't that they, that I, it was, it was oh, what was like to have the cameras there? I knew they were there. I just didn't care. And I, I just let them in. And uh, there are, that was, uh, at, at the beginning it was, that took some getting used to, but within a month or so I, I could care less. Um, you know, I don't look at it as, I look at it as, uh, it, it was a rare opportunity. I mean, what an incredible chance to memorialize my life and my work forever, you know, my, for my kids to see, my grandkids to see. You know, I think my daughter's reaction, Cindy and Rachel, um, to see them get to know me in a different way. And I know Ben, uh, you know, felt that way too, that, that he, you saw this aspect of, of a, a part of my life that they were never gonna understand. My youngest, Molly, who's a senior in high school now, you know, when she first saw the first show, she got upset. I mean, I think she was a big Grey's Anatomy fan and all this, you know, she'd seen TV and, and TV doctors in a certain way. And I think in her own mind, she thought I'd be a certain way, like I am at home, which I never get upset at home pretty much. And I'm kind of mellow and forget things. And I'm a freaking moron, basically. But when I'm at work, I'm a, I have a different persona. And... Um, there's no question that they created fiction out of fact, meaning they created a persona of me for the show, uh, which I also developed a profound respect for actors. They, the actors create fiction, uh, fact out of fiction, right. we create fiction out of fact. And so when she saw me in the first episode, she was upset. And I had to stop the show. I was like, what's wrong? Oh, you're not like this. You know, people are going to think you're not nice or something. And um, that was so such a unique uh experience for me I have I can't imagine you know celebrities horrible I, I just think to actually need that and need to be attracted to it and people come what's it like to be recognized it was funny I was with Kate this morning and someone recognized me you know I I don't it's just me you know and I, I you you immediately I've realized like I don't need this for my future I'm a physician first and this other piece of me is nice I want to use this to influence young people and to be a voice of empathy and event, uh, you know, caring for people, not to in, you know, enhance my career necessarily. I'm, I'm, although people say, what are you gonna do with this? I'm still figuring that out. But so the answer to that question is, you know, it's not the TV thing allowed me to see myself and people who know me in a different way. It's given me, you know, it's an optics, given me credibility where to, you know, I was always the same. 
but I also have learned to see myself differently, learned to have a, I have a voice and I want to be a voice of, these are the, the kind of like things I'd like to be able to promote going forward in my life. Right. Going along the lines of um, the idea of caring for patients and empathy, um, what changes would you like to see in the medical and healthcare system in the US as it is uh, today? And do you think they'd be implemented in the coming years or decades? First of all, I think single payer is not a great idea for a variety of reasons. I'm not gonna get into the politics of it, but it's uh, in this country, we just can't do it. Um, health, medical school is too expensive. The malpractice environment, if you tell me medical school is free and there's no malpractice and you'll pay for my kids to go to school, then you can make medical school single payer because then we can, but that's Europe. Um, you can't have a socialist healthcare system in a capitalist society. You'll, you, you will destroy it. That's my opinion. On the other hand, I think we have to be better the way we pay physicians. Physician, physician should be salaried. And there shouldn't be a financial incentive to do a single case. Now, there are going to be people who are more valuable because their skills and, and, and the case they bring in, so you'll pay them more. That's the way our society works, that we encourage ambition and money is a measure of, your, of, the, of how talented you are. So you need to have some financial incentive, but it can't be one-to-one. -one. So if I were to redesign the system, I would basically say, okay, here's the way it's going to go. You're going to be paid a salary. You'll have some small incentive and you won't be paid by how many cases you do. You'll be paid based on outcome and what the diagnosis is and getting the right solutions. And that I think is complicated. It would require a lot of work, but I do think that would be a huge way forward. And that's the way our departments, you know, look, you don't go from in 2013, Lenox Hill Nursery didn't exist. We had no, it was, it didn't exist. There were no people there. And now in 2020, we're a top 15 US News World Report. We have a Netflix show and our volume is killing it, but we're all salaried in New York City, all of us. And what does that tell you? It tells you this is, we're in the capitalist center of the world, probably one of the highest cost of livings in the country. And yet we somehow managed to put this together and we're killing it, um, both on a clinical level, on an emotional level, on a spiritual level and on a, a media level. And it's because we care about one another. We have each other's backs. We care about our patients. We, it's, you know, we, we set an example for the way to take care of people. It's not, that's reproducible and scalable if it's done properly. Right. And the only places that I've seen, um, you know, eliminating or reducing cost of medical school so far have been NYU recently. And then also, um, I know MD, PhD programs, at least, I don't know if all of them, but some of them are government funded. Well, the trouble with the Hughes thing and MD, PhD is a lot of these people, they, they choose to do this out of financial need. And then they end up not going into becoming scientists because it was never about the science. It was getting going for free. I mean, I have a, uh, like, I know multiple MD, PhDs that are just like, private practice spine surgeons, you know, it's, it's not a good right. model, but there are more and more schools that are, and now that NYU has set the standard, you know, I think that uh, more, Sinai has a program like that, Penn is a program, the top schools are all going to be competitive, they're all going to find a way to do it, and eventually I think medical school will become cheaper, it has to. I mean, there was right. an article in the Wall Street Journal about, I don't know, last, in the last five to ten years, they looked at the, they looked at the investments that, that you make you know, MBA, law school, med school, it's not even close. I mean, not only do you have to pay, you know, $80,000 a year in these private schools or half that for or a state school for four years, then you're a resident and you're making chump change, you're getting paid. So by the time you're, so it, it really encourages people to go to high earning fields who need it or, you know, shorten their residency because they can't afford it. That's just a travesty. And that's really under the underpinning of a lot of the, the problems in our healthcare system. So I think if we change the cost of, of training, that you will solve at least not all, but some of these, these kind of asymmetric kind of inefficiencies in the types of people that go to medical school and what people choose to do. Right. So off of that then, what would you say to students who are considering this path but are unsure if they really want to do it? This path being maybe specifically neurosurgery. Well, number one, I, I, it's not for everyone. So... And I'm very, I consider myself very, very lucky, you know, I, but I've, I've really screwed up a bunch of times. I've made bad mistakes. I, you know, the Netflix thing was just, you know, that, that drug, you know, all of a sudden a lot of attention is on me and the Klieg lights are on me. And that's not going to happen to everybody. You know, that, you shouldn't go into medical school to be a net, on Netflix. 
you know, I never did it for that reason. Um, so that's number one. I, I look, you have to, and when I was applying, any, it wasn't that anybody could do it. People went to medical school that never should have been doctors. People used to apply to medical school and law school, see what they get in and maybe they'll decide. That's insane. So you have to know, you have to be very self-aware. You have to know you're willing to make sacrifice. You have to know that you're really willing to care about other people, not only patients, but your partners. They you have to be willing to make massive sacrifices in order to do valuable things. On the other hand, you may want to do, make less like, less sacrifice, do less valuable things. I mean, maybe you just want to go and work in Wall Street. I mean, maybe you want to go and do something that's not quite as meaningful because you want to have that more time with your family and children and make more money because it's just not worth it. You just, it's just not who you are. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, the world needs other people besides doctors and nurses for that matter. So know yourself first, know what you're willing, that you're willing to make a sacrifice. And then as far as what kind of doctor you want to be, I would wait, you know, uh, wait and see when you get to medical school, you know, watch other people, get to know people, ask questions, you know, see if you want to find someone that you're like, that you see someone that you look at them and you respect what they're doing, that you see something of yourself in that person, and you're pretty sure within a certain, certain risk that you could do that and that they represent the type of person you wanna be. And I think if you do that, you're, you're, you're likely gonna be successful. Right. I have one more question from the students. Um, so with your reputation as a neurosurgeon and now your experience with Netflix, I'm sure you're being asked to give your time and philanthropy in many places. Um, we're wondering when it comes to your own personal time and your family time, what do you think about, uh, what do you take into consideration when considering um, how you'd like to give back to community or, or would you give any advice to the Syracuse community on um, what it takes to do so? Well, there's never enough time in a day. You know, I do the best I can. I, 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 it's, it's a struggle. I'm honest with you. I mean, I, I always wish I had more time with my kids. There's more there for them. Um, I, I, I have a trouble saying no because uh, I, I enjoy being, doing great, fun things. And, you know, I think my, my family knows that about me. They know me well enough to know that I, 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 my intent is good. It doesn't always come out that way. I think in order to, when you're ambitious and you really want to be impactful, it's hard, you know, you, if you're, I mean, I, I, for those of you who've seen Hamilton, uh, I, I love Hamilton. I was just with Ben, Ben today and his, and his girlfriend, Julia, who love Hamilton. You know, when I, when I saw the show a couple of times, then read the book and then got the music and then watched the show a million times on Disney. And you realize that, not that I'm Hamilton, but the, the pain and suffering that uh, when you're really driven by a passion, to do something extraordinary. It takes away from a lot of other things. And you have to make choices in life. You know, I think it's, if you really want to do something, if you have that in you, that you love being challenged and you really want to do that, you, you, you have to be careful because it can be intoxicating and like heroin, it's hard to break away from it. And in some ways I, I have to, I work, I'm trying to work hard at that with myself and you're constantly trying to make yourself better but there's no good answer to that. You, you, you have to respect the fact that nothing in life that's worth doing comes without hard work, nothing. Nothing's easy, you gotta get lucky, but you create your own luck in some ways, you're gonna fail, you're gonna make mistakes, you have to learn from those situations. Failure is a good thing. Um, it, it, it requires that you overcome that and, and aren't too hard on yourself. You know, and I'm 57 now and I'm still learning how to, how to deal with this stuff. So. In the end, I think you just know yourself, know what you're, you, you got to understand what you need, sacrifice you're willing to make. And, uh, and then, it, then you just go and it's, there's no end to it. You know, there's no, don't think like, oh, it's, I'm going to go to this and I'm going to do that. It's just one long continuum. It never ends. And uh, I think that to me, my life has only gotten even more uh, interesting later on, even though I'm, I'm I do different things now and I, I I'm, I'm, you know, I'm learning every day. Right. That is unfortunately all the time that we have um, for student questions, but I just want to say thank you again. And on behalf of the student body, thank you so much for joining us um, and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us all. Um, I'm now going to pass it back over to Sandra Hewitt. And I just want to thank you again to Dr. Langham for coming out. And, you know, obviously you have many things that you could do and being so candid with us and um, really 
you know, not sugarcoating it <laughs> on any front. So, um, and now I'm going to turn it back to Kate Loseco and she's going to close our program. So thanks again um, and stay safe and stay well. I'm going to say, Sandra, I'm sure you're, I don't know how old you are, but. 55. <laughs> when, you were, when you were younger, yeah. there were women in science. And uh, the women, you were I could women. tell you stories, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but neuroscience is highly uh, has about 50, at least 50 percent women, I must say. It's not why I chose it. Uh, but yes, you're correct. And everything that you said, though, about women is the same. But I, I did have my child. I, I don't mind telling people that I had my child later, but not on purpose because I was so into my work. Um, and exactly what you said. And even I fight it now. I mean, COVID, I can work at home, but it's difficult sometimes to, you realize, you look at the clock and you think you're going to leave. And then the next thing you know, it's an hour later. And you're, you're Two hours later. <laughs> exactly. And you're running for the door because exactly for the reasons that you said. And so it's a struggle no matter what, because it is your passion, it is what you do. And, and it is who you are. Uh, and it, no matter what you do, like you said. It is, so yeah, I agree. Kate. Dr. Langer, a huge thank you. Somehow you had coffee with this with me this morning, ended up back in New York City to do a church event and then meet with us tonight. So Dr. Langer, thank you so much. Dr. Hewitt, Kat, on behalf of the Syracuse University community, thank you immensely for sharing this evening with us. Uh, Dr. Langer, I know I've mentioned this to you before. Um, one of my favorite Lenox Hill scenes is when an aspiring neurosurgeon, like the young ones that you're talking about and some of ours in our audience tonight said to you, um, Dr. Langer, I wanna be you. And you turned to him and you said something along the lines of, no, you wanna be you and I'm gonna help you. So thank you for your compassion for others in and outside of the OR for inspiring us all to be our best selves. We look forward to seeing more of you, hopefully on campus again, or great on our campus um, post COVID and shout out to Ben Langer. Check him out on Spotify. He's a really good musician uh -huh. as well as a Bandier student. We are glad uh, you're both forever a part of our Orange family. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Bye. <laughs>